like to welcome you to Boy Meets Wellness, a podcast that discusses the complexities, celebrations, and challenges of building a wellness ritual as a BOI, a person who is born obviously incredible. You are now listening to Boy Meets Wellness with poet, motivational speaker, and wellness lover, Evolve Benson. BOI, born obviously incredible, especially when you wear it pretty. Happy Friday, Boy Meets Wellness community. Before we jump into the interview, I want to ask you if you got my free holiday gift. This year, I'm gifting the first 200 people who join my free Speaking for Profit, How to Build a Six-Figure Speaking Business group, a free ebook. When the book drops, it will be $20. I spent the last six months writing and putting this amazing book together, and I want you to have it. So head over to EvolveBenton.com and click Speaking for Profit to join our group and get your exclusive gift. Today's episode features the amazing Jefferson Darrell. Jefferson Darrell is an accomplished marketing communications and change management professional with more than 15 years of brand strategy expertise, generating earned and owned media using both traditional and digital channels. He is highly effective in stakeholder relations, negotiating, conceiving, and cultivating mutual beneficial partnerships. Having worked on numerous integrated marketing campaigns on both the agency and client side, Jefferson brings a broad understanding of the entire marketing mix to every project. In the DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion space, Jefferson was instrumental in the creation of the Diversity, Inclusion, Anti-Racism Action Team at the Ontario Science Centre, and he represented the Centre on the DEI Committee with the Canadian Association of Science Centres. Jefferson has been an active participant in diversity and inclusion conferences, including Progress Together for the Ontario Public Service and Canada's first ever white privileged global conference at Ryerson University. He also was instrumental in organizing the Science Center's involvement in the world's first Pride in STEM Day on July 5, 2018. Jefferson's change management project with the Black Coalition of AIDS Prevention resulted in increased revenue opportunities for the nonprofit charity by diversifying the organization's fundraising and development committee. Jefferson has delivered numerous presentations and keynote addresses about the importance of DEI, including how to cultivate inclusive workplace cultures at the IDEA Summit and diversity in public relations at the 2018 Global PR Summit. Jefferson earned a Bachelor's of Applied Science in Chemical Engineering from the University of Waterloo, a Public Relations Honor Certificate from Humber College, and is a Change Management Leadership and Inclusion graduate from Sentinel College and the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion, and working towards the Canadian Certified Certified Inclusion Professional designation. Jefferson is an amazing individual And I'm super excited to bring him on the show so that we can hear about his amazing work that he has going on with his company, Breakfast Culture. Before we jump into the interview, I'd like to share my wellness tip of the week with you. I personally struggle with SAD, and I know that many of my listeners may struggle with SAD also. SAD is a seasonal affective disorder. According to the National Institute of Health, SAD is a type of depression that comes and goes with the seasons typically starting in late fall and early winter and going away during spring and summer. Here are some tips from that website, eatthis.com, on how to navigate and beat sad. Number one, get some sunlight, especially in the morning if you can. Morning is a great time to get outside. Number two, walk every day. Get outside in nature, look at some trees, breathe in the fresh air. Number three, keep a gratitude journal. This is one of my favorites. When I'm feeling depressed and alone, I get into a moment of gratitude and realize how much I have going for myself. Number four, exercise or move if that's what you want to call it. Exercise doesn't have to be going to the gym. You can get up and dance to your favorite Beyonce song. Just get your body to moving. Warm it up. Number five, reduce your alcohol intake. If you didn't know, alcohol is a depressant. So if you drink more, you're going to be depressed more, right? So if you can, reduce your alcohol intake. Number six, keep a consistent sleep schedule, right? So 
try to wake up and go to sleep at the same time. I know that that can be very difficult when you're feeling depression, but maybe you don't sleep as long as you want to, just so you can keep that schedule going. So I know I've been trying to set an alarm more just to make sure that I'm waking up and going to sleep at the same time. Number seven, meditation. Go within. Maybe you do that in the morning. Maybe do it twice in the morning and at night right before bed. And number eight, take breaks from the screen. I realize that many of us are working from home or doing a lot more on the screen just to stay connect- connected to our families and communities. But taking a break from, break from that blue light really supports us with being able to get good sleep at night um, and supports us from navigating past sad. So if you can, take a break. If you have the privilege to be able to walk away from some of those spaces, I know a lot of people are like, don't turn off your camera on Zoom. Turn that camera off and take care of your body. Take care of yourself. I hope these tips support you in beating sad. It's really supported me. Today's episode is brought to you by Mar Media Productions. Mar Media is a media production company that produces, publishes, and uplifts the stories, arts, and journeys of queer and trans people of color and the people who make our lives incredible. Now for our interview with Jefferson. Hello, world. Welcome to Boy Meets Wellness. I'm super pumped about today's interview with my friend, my good, good friend that I actually met on LinkedIn. Y'all, I don't meet that many folks on LinkedIn, but this has been an amazing connection uh, to meet folks just across the world. So Jefferson, welcome to Boy Meets Wellness. Thank you so much for being here. Can you just tap in with your name, pronoun, and what brings you joy? So my name is Jefferson Darrell. I am the founder of Breakfast Culture. My pronouns are he, him. I would have to say what brings me joy. It's been challenging just this time of year because of COVID, but I would have to say, I'm going to quote Doctor Who here, my friends have always been the best part of me. And hanging with my friends, enjoying my company of my friends, cooking with, cooking for, you know, hanging out with my friends, um, that actually brings me a lot of joy. And that's something that I've actually grown to appreciate a lot more um, during this quarantine time. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I think this is a tough year for many of us. You know, 2020 has been the year of years. My dad always tells me it feels like we've been living through a decade through one year, right? Like it feels like the longest year possible. So let's talk a little bit about COVID-19. Like what have been some of your wellness practices to kind of like keep yourself grounded during this time? That's a very good question. I'm going to take that. I'm going to actually talk a little bit about the phrase self-care. I think that's been a very, very important phrase for 2020, especially for Black folks. The reason why I say that is, in addition to COVID, layer on all of the, oh, look at us getting political here, um, all right out the gate. But no, but truly, but in all true honesty, I mean, for me at least, I mean, with, you know, with COVID initially, a lot of my wellness practices were around, as you said, bringing me joy. So reaching out, for me, it was a lot about reaching out to friends. I'm single, I live alone. So one thing I started doing was reaching out to a lot of other friends that I know or family members who are also single, living alone. I have an aunt, she's what, she's a pank, professional aunt, no kids. She lives in Alberta. And so she and I have gotten a lot closer through all of this, reaching out to a number of my friends, um, posting on social media, at least once a week. At the beginning, I was very much, hey, check in, how's everyone doing this, you know, this week? You know, does anyone need a phone call or what have you? So a lot of my wellness practices at the beginning was reaching out to others, especially those who were comparable to me in terms of like living alone or what have you. Uh, then the events of George Floyd, etc., happened. And that just, that was brutal. Like, I don't know how else to put it. And I, I personally, like a lot of us, I would say, I stopped watching the news. I just, I couldn't. And I just stopped, turned media off. And my wellness practice was just kind of depression and lying in bed a lot. And then I remember on June 1st, that big photo op with the church and the Bible, I was scrolling through my feeds and it was mainly my black friends who were, what's going on? What's happening? I was like, what's going on? And I missed it because I'd stopped watching the news and I got cut up and I saw what had happened. And like all of us, I was a wreck, quite frankly. I was very much, I was emotionally drained. I was exhausted. I mean, everything. And I hadn't felt that emotional or upset, frankly, since 9-11 myself. And going back to self-care, and that's when I started having a true and better understanding of self-care. So one of my good friends who does inclusion and diversity work as well, 
he was hosting, um, he calls them spoonfuls for the journey. And he said he was hosting one that coming Saturday. So this would have been like June 5th or whatever that Saturday was. And he said, this is for Black peoples. Like, it's for Black peoples. We need this. Please join. And I told a few of my friends about it. And we went and we joined. And it helped me. I don't know how to put it. And he talked a lot about self-care. He talked a lot about with what's coming up, everything. And it was just nice to have, especially because of COVID, because we're also separated because of quarantine. It was nice to have that community feel and realize you um, you aren't alone. And then going back to that concept of self-care, I started realizing self-care means different things for different people. And a lot of it for me was turning into being able to say no. Like case in point, I do a lot of inclusion and diversity work. And I realized when I do specifically around anti-Black racism, I realized for me, I have to do those sessions in the afternoon, mid to late afternoon, because they're so draining. And for me, that self-care means, no, I'm done. Like, I just need to sit and, you know, even if I'm vegging out and watching Animaniacs or just whatever, just that to me is just, I, I, I can't just deal with it anymore. I don't know how else to put it. Example, this week, I was in a session in the afternoon that I had um, racial justice and equity in the public relations field. And then that evening, there was another one around racial justice equity in terms of educating Black men. And when the evening came, I was just, you know what, I am drained. And I was interested, I wanted to go, but I just thought, and often you feel that whole FOMO, you know, fear of missing out or guilt for not going or what have you. And I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm done for today. Like, I just need to relax and veg out and be like, put on a movie or something. And, you know, and so I did, I sat and I watched Harry Potter, like, and that for me was just my self care. Cause it was just recognizing, I guess when, okay, Jefferson, you've given enough, you, you've dealt with it enough. You need to recharge your energy, recharge your batteries. And that's when I think the biggest lesson that I've taken from 2020 is learning to say no and understanding it's okay that you don't always have to be present in a space if you're not going to frankly be present in a space exactly showing up as your full self right your full authentic Uh self your energized self right i'm so appreciative of you like this is the beginning of the podcast and you're already mentioning the power of boundaries right so i recently did not instagram facebook live video for folks who want to check it out on my personal profile where i was talking about tips for folks doing diversity, equity, inclusion work. And one of my main tips was setting up boundaries in the beginning of relationships, right? So that you don't look like you're missing out or you don't look like you're not showing up, right? So when you get that diversity, equity, inclusion job, you don't need to be working 25 hours a day or staying up all late at night or answering emails in the middle of the night, because then that tells people they have permission, right, to cross those boundaries. And when you try to set them up later on, it's hard to do. So before you go too far into it, because I want people to know a little bit more about you, where were you born, right? Where do you live now in retrospect? And where do you want to be, right? Because we're always dreaming here on Boy Meets Wellness. So where did you grow up? Where do you live now? And where do you want to be? So. I was born in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I'm a little bit ashamed to admit that I actually live about a kilometer from where I was born, um, the hospital downtown. So I was born in downtown Toronto. I actually grew up in the suburbs, North York, for those who are familiar with the GTA. When I grew up, it was its own city just north of Toronto. Now it is part of the mega city of the greater Toronto area, if you will. So that's where I grew up. And then I moved back downtown. To your point in terms of where I wanted to be, 20 years ago, I actually was looking to leave Canada. My background is I have a degree in chemical engineering, but I moved a whole other story, but I moved from there into public relations, marketing communications. And I found Canada was a really small market for that type of work. And I saw the most interesting work was being done in Europe, um, in particular in Amsterdam, where it's great. I'm an English speaker. You can work in English there as well as other languages, but you can also work in English. Um, And I was looking in London. I was um, interviewing in the Bay Area, in LA, in New York, Chicago. I ended up staying, though, for family reasons. Um, My sister announced her pregnancy. My niece, God bless her, she's 20 now, and she was born. And I remember thinking, because a good friend of mine who did move to Amsterdam, and I asked her if she had any regrets, and her biggest regret was not being around to see her nieces and nephews grow up. And you know, my sister's you know single mother, and I really just wanted to be there to help her out to see my niece grow up the whole bit. So I ended up staying. 
on. I'm glad I did. I would never change that for a million years. I love Keanu to death. Um, and that's another reason why I'm also inspired to do a lot of this work. In terms of where I'm going, it's funny you ask that because I've been thinking a lot about that as in she's now off away at school, um, out of Toronto. Technically, there's really nothing keeping me in the city anymore. So aside from you know COVID, as it were, I'm open to different possibilities. I'm quite, com- unfortunately or fortunately, actually, no, fortunately, I would say I'm quite comfortable in Toronto right now. I have a really good group of circle of friends, um, strong relationship with my family. Most of my core family is here, immediate family, that is. So, yeah. So and I'd say I'm, for the short term, definitely Toronto. But that said, I am open to other cities. Um, who knows what the future holds? One thing I've been actually taking out of 2020, um, for me at least, is I've been trying to embrace change a lot more because I find it as humans, well, I shouldn't say that for me. I shouldn't speak for other folks. For myself, I know it's easy to just be comfortable in routine and that's fine. And I think, you know, that's fine. But sometimes I notice for me, I've been getting too comfortable and I've been purposely doing things and making changes in my life on purpose. And one of the big changes I'm looking at now is I'm actually looking at moving, staying in the city, but you know, moving to a new space as part of that change. But that said, who knows? Something might happen in another city at this point. Really cool. I love that you're leaving us with a little bit of a cliffhanger, right? Like we shall see, you know, post-COVID, you know, who knows? You could be in London, you could be in LA, you could be here in the Bay Area, which would be really cool for us to meet in person. I would love to take you around to Napa and some of the wineries here. I think you would love it, especially with your style. Like I have seen you put together um, amazing style. So thank you for, for giving us all of that and all of that amazing energy. So let's talk a little bit about gratitude, right? Because I feel like anchored in anyone being successful is a group of people that we don't see. So if you had three people on your gratitude list, who would they be? Um, that's a very good question. Thank you for that one. So the three people on my gratitude list... I would say at the top of the list would be my sister. I, she and I, we have our moments, but I would say up until, actually, no, not up until. I, I often, and I think we both take our relationship for granted. Uh, and, I, and I mean that in a good way, as in we're very close to each other. We don't have any secrets. An example that I remember my mother said to me once, oh, Jefferson, I'm going to tell you something you can't tell your sister. And I said, well, mom, don't tell me because I tell Cheryl and I, we talk about everything together. You know, if you, if I can't tell Cheryl, then just don't tell me because there's just no point. She's like, okay, fine. You can tell your sister. And as much as we bicker every now and then, I realize that from a lot of my friends, they don't have the same relationship that with their siblings that I do with my sister. Um, yeah, I don't know how to put it. So she's one person I'm very, very thankful and grateful to have in my life. We weren't always this close. She's actually 10 years older than I am. So growing up, she was very much my big sister and I was her kid brother. And like, she was like the babysitter of all of that. We really, I would say, started bonding when I was in my 20s. Frankly, I was in school. The way she tells a story, I love how she tells a story. Well, I started bonding with my baby brother when we went drinking together. And that's what happened. I mean, she would go back to, we went to the same school, same university. She would go back to visit friends there. I happened to be there in school and she'd call me up to say, hey, you know, me and my friends were going to be at such a bar if you want to join us. And I'd go because I'm like, here, you know, they're in their 30s. I'm in my 20s. I'm a student. I'm not making any money. And they're like, oh, you're a student. Let me buy you beer. It's like, okay, yay. Um, and then I was like, oh, my sister's actually kind of cool. And she's like, oh, my brother's actually kind of cool. And then we started bonding. Um, my second person would definitely be one of my best friends, Kenneth. Um, we met at a coming out group um, in our early 20s at the 519 Church Street Community Center in downtown Toronto. Um, it was an LGBT youth group. Um, he's racialized. He's South Asian. Um, he was the only other racialized queer person in the group. The two of us bonded on our newcomers day. And I frankly credit him with saving my life. Um, he has also admitted to crediting, crediting me with saving his life. I say that as in when we came out, again, this would have been the mid nineties or so as racialized peoples in the LGBTQ plus communities, we still experienced quite a bit of racism. I mean, he was called expletives. I was called expletives. A lot of the resources that were there were great if you were, frankly, white. 
but I was going through some very different experiences and I thought I was really alone. And then when I was chatting about it with him, he's like, no, you're not alone. I'm seeing it too. And we both realized that there's a very different experience when you're racialized coming out versus, you know, if you're white and coming out, I'm part of that dominant culture, if you will. So he and I bonded and we have been friends. He's like my brother, actually. We have been friends ever since. So that would be Kenneth. And then the last person, I mean, in terms of gratitude, there are quite a few actually, but I'm going to say the person I was on the phone with late last night, um, another good friend of mine, Vincent. He's queer as well. We met early on in my career. And so Kenneth and Vincent became part of my adopted family, if you will, to the point where like, I know all of Ken's family. I'm part of his family. Um, Ken and Vincent are part of my family. My niece calls them Uncle Kenneth, Uncle Vincent. I know Ken's, you know, nieces and nephews. I know Vincent's kids. And yeah, and I mean, they were, I've had some challenges in my life, physically, mentally, emotionally. And between them and my sister, they've really helped help me get through things. I mean, I've known, obviously I know my sister all my life. I've known them for over 20 years. And I'm quite thankful that they're in my life. And I'm really thankful that I met them. Yeah, those are the three people I'd say who I'm, quite grateful for. There are a few more on that list, but they're my top three. Beautiful, beautiful. I knew you had a mountain of people behind you because you're such a brilliant human being. So let's talk about breakfast culture. I am super excited. I, I remember going to your website and seeing Let's Break Eggs. And I was like, this is a great tagline. Like this makes me want to jump into action. So can you tell us a little bit about like when did you create this company? Uh, what do you do? Uh, and how do you serve? So Breakfast Culture was a bit of a rebrand and repositioning, if you will. It was about two or three years ago. So we're talking about 2017, 2018. Previously to that, I was running more of a traditional public relations firm called Jefferson Darrell and Associates, or JDA. A lot of the work I was doing from a PR lens, I would have a client who would say, you know what, we have a really great widget, whatever that is, you know, service, product, whatever it is. We have three different audiences, ABC. They're all interested in our widget. How can we communicate to those audiences while being authentic to our brand, but also not alienating them? But we also want to cultivate new and different diverse audiences, but still be authentic to our brands. Public relations at its core, at its core um, function, is about changing perceptions, getting people to think differently and ultimately act differently. In this case, that's why I say marketing communications, i.e. buy my widget, as it were. So... And at the core of it, when you think about inclusion and diversity work, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people to change perceptions. We want people to think differently so they'll ultimately act differently. Or ultimately, what I say at Breakfast Culture, what, what we're trying to impart and teach people is empathy at the end of the day. So I ended up rebranding JDA, Jefferson Dillon Associates, into Breakfast Culture. I chose Breakfast Culture, the name Breakfast Culture. Uh, comes from that Peter Drucker quote, um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I've seen it, I've been in organizations where they've had phenomenal business strategy, like great ideas, great strategy, you know, everything's on point. But then their culture is out of whack or wonky, and the strategy just comes completely to a halt. So in an ideal scenario, an ideal client, breakfast culture works where inclusion and diversity intersects with marketing and communications. So we look at inclusion and diversity with a business lens, and in terms of a return on investment on this type of thinking. And we always impart to our clients, it's not so much what you do. So, you know, the training, DNI audits, that's all great. And we're not knocking that, but it's really about how you do it. How are you being inclusive to different peoples? And I don't just mean cosmetic diversity, you know, issues of race, issues of gender, et cetera, abilities. I'm talking even cognitive diversity. So, you know, do you hire all of your um, people from the Bay Area or do you hire all your people from Toronto? So you're going to have a very different mindset from Bay Area people to Toronto people to, say, you know, more um, rural folks or what have you. Do you hire all the same people from the same schools, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we bring in different types of peoples and thinking to spark innovation, spark creativity, and ultimately a huge return on investment for your bottom line? So that's really what Breakfast Culture is about. Brilliant. So you said in the beginning of the interview that you um, had a degree, right, in engineering. So how did you get from engineering to public relations? Uh, was that an easy switch over for you? Have you always done more communications work? Naturally, I would say yes. So 
I apologize because we're going to take a slightly scenic version. I'm going to try and Twitter it down. But so when I was in um, what they call Ontario academic courses here, um, it's sort of like a, after grade 12, you would take these courses if you want to go on to a university or a college. So I was very strong in English, um, very strong in maths, very strong in chemistry. Wasn't a fan of physics, hence chemical engineering. And I also really liked history a lot, but specifically like ancient history, like Egyptian mythology, um, you know, First Nations mythology, stories, Norse mythology, like all that sort of like early cultures and think anthropology, that type of um, work. And my plan was to go to school and study English and classical studies, like ancient histories. And my cousin, who was a marine biologist, pulled me aside and said, well, I hear you're thinking of, you know, English, and you're also looking at maybe engineering. And again, I say I was actually the product of a PR campaign because they were really pushing STEM back then. So science, technology, engineering, and math. And my cousin basically convinced me that, well, English is great. It's what you're interested in, but you're going to get a job if you go through engineering and science. So that's why I did engineering and science. After my first year, I hated it. I was like, this is not for me. I was ready to drop out. However, what saved me is because it was engineering at the end of the day is applied science. So my degree is officially a Bachelor of Applied Science in Chemical Engineering. So every time we did our lab work, every assignment we had to do, make a presentation and write a paper about how can we use this technology for the betterment of humankind? Like, what's the application? That's where I shone. Like, I was not an A-plus sort of techie student where I shone in engineering and there's a lot of group work was okay we now have to take this in technical information and communicate it and that's PR work and I remember the day when I was in um, I think it was my second year it was me Brian and then Dave and Brad we were all in a group together Brian was like the A plus top student amazing at um the lab work and it was Dave and Brad who actually pointed out said we are in the dream group and Brian and I were like what do you mean It's like, well, Brian's going to be Mr. He's sitting in the lab and everything. Jefferson's going to be our front man and he's going to make all the presentations and do the writing. We'll just coast. You tell us what you need us to do. And I started recognizing my my, um, value and where my strengths strengths were in terms of my skill sets. And it was communications. So by my fourth year, I recognized that I wanted to do PR, um, public relations. I didn't know you could actually get paid to write. I mean, uh, in engineering, I was editing the engineering student newspaper. Uh, before I was the made editor of that, I was actually editing um, a little newsletter that they put out. This is before podcasts. A little newsletter that was put out, I quadrupled the circulation of this newsletter. If you're familiar with engineering culture, there are a lot of practical jokes that happen. And I remember the day when I got punked, they took my engine newsletter, one of the classes, Brew, they called, they created an engine Brew's letter. And they made a mock newsletter. I mean, they're like, you're okay with the chips. I'm like, are you kidding me? This is great. Like, means you like it. And they did a whole mock newsletter. And that to me was I'd arrived because it's like, hey, they, you know, played a practical joke, which was great. So that's when I went back to school and studied public relations. Yeah, that's pretty much that in a short-ish version. <laughs> I love that you said Twitter it down. Um, that, that I've never heard of that one before. That was hilarious. So breakfast culture, I, I, I hear you're doing, you're kind of like working with businesses on their strategic planning, right? Like really shifting the way that they look at diversity, right? Like really shedding that lens to make it a little bit more complex. What are some of the celebrations of the work that you get to do? And then what are some of the challenges? So celebrations, I find, um, again, the work that I do at the end of the day, what I'm trying to impart to people, I would say, and my clients is empathy. And what I find when we do this inclusion and diversity work and what I impart to a lot of my clients is it's an organizational journey, but more importantly, it's also a personal journey. And one thing that I've learned, I apologize, I'm going to take a slight tangent here. Um, And this was a difficult lesson for me to learn, but it's an important lesson, I think, especially for people who do this work. Not everyone's, A, number one, not everyone wants to do this work. And I know that, I get that, and I understand that. I don't think everyone does. I think people are like, oh, you're a block, teach me. And it's like, well, no, I just want to do my accounting. I'm happy. Like, And that's fine. Not everybody wants to do this work. I do want to do this work, so I'm happy to do this work, and I do this work. And where I was going with all of this is when I see a client who is, is genuinely making that personal commitment and is really trying to look at it from the other person's perspective. May I share a quick story with you, Evolve? So I have a good friend who is racialized. Um, she's Chinese. 
and we were chatting. And she and I, I've known her for years. We actually bonded, interestingly, over systemic discrimination in the PR space. And just recently, she called me up and asked, you know, do you think I'm racist? And I said, no, why would you think you're racist? So, well, so-and-so called me racist at work today. I was like, oh, okay, but I'm not racist. And where I'm going with this is, and again, we're taking scenic route here, is I find when people, when we do this work, again, I think of allyship. A lot of times people don't center the oppressed. They center themselves. So when, when the word racism, you know, sexism, insert your ism here. These days it's a lot around race. When those words come up, people immediately like, oh, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I'm not racist. And I remember saying to my friend, well, okay, first, I don't think you're racist. But that said, let's take a look at the situation that made this person call you racist. Like what was specific to the situation that made them think that? Let's look at that. And that's the part that I find a lot of people are missing out on is in it's immediately, oh, I'm not racist. It's like, okay, well, we're not talking about you now. Let's look at why someone might think. And I said, like, when you, um, without getting into too many details on that front, but she was announcing a new policy and she had singled this person out. And where I'm going with this is, okay, so how did you announce the policy? Was this person in the room? Did you share it with everybody? Did you just go to them individually? Like That's where I'm getting at in terms of maybe that's why they're thinking you're racist was around that communication piece in terms of how did it happen? And again, I go, it's not always what you do, it's how you do things. So maybe they weren't in that meeting when you announced it to the entire group and that now when you're singling this person out, they feel singled out. So maybe that's why they're thinking that. So that's where I go back to that how piece. And that's what I try to impart a lot to my clients, as in let's unpack what's happening to the oppressed and is making them feel this way. So forget yourself. And hopefully from that, you will learn. And maybe the lesson there is, I mean, and sometimes it could just be, I'm just going to be blunt here, that person might have, you know, a chip on their shoulder, as it were. Or I find nine times out of 10, it's usually, oh, okay, well, when this information was communicated, that person was away that day. And now they do feel singled out because they weren't aware of the broader message. Again, I don't know. Um, what I try to work with with my clients, again, is ultimately, as I like to say, it's about empathy, understanding what your privilege is, understanding how you benefit from your privilege. And ideally through that, you'll see your blind spots. And I use a lot of I statements. I share my own, like, for example, for myself, I talk about my own journey, especially around privilege. As a black gay man, Evolve, if you had asked me 10 years ago, Jefferson, do you have any privilege? I would have looked you in the eye and said unequivocally, I have zero privilege in society. What I've come to realize, though, is I have lots of privileges. I, my male privilege was the first one. And that's the part that fascinates me on this journey is I always thought of myself as someone who was, I'd say, supportive of women's issues and a bit more knowledgeable. The reason why I say that is, and I said, like, I have a sister, I have a mother, like, you know, you know, my father, and we were brought up very much aware of these issues. And I always thought I was. And I'd say about six years ago for me, I thought at one point, I'm like, oh my God, women put up with so much, excuse my language, you're crap. And I was just, I was in a, I was just really depressed about it. I was a member chatting about with my sister, my female colleagues. They're all like looking at me, they're crossing their arms. Like, yeah, tell me something I don't know. And so I was, I remember saying, so it's not worse for women today. It's like, no, 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 it's always been like this. You just never noticed. And that was a huge eye-opener for me. And I mean, and that's what I try to impart to a lot of my, um, my clients. And I always share that story in terms of, yeah, so you don't necessarily know your blind spots. And that's why it's funny, I'm still learning that. And that's why I would say we're all on our own journeys. We're all still learning. And that's what I'm hoping people are rather unlearning and then relearning. And that for me was a huge, huge eye-opener. I mean, the only other time I ever felt sort of like that light bulb, I don't know how to put it, was for my queerness. I remember the first time I kissed another man and suddenly, it sounds so cliche, but all the love songs, all the love stories, I was like, oh, this is what everyone's talking about. These are the feelings. These are the emotions. Wow, I had never experienced this before. And it was, for me, it was just this flood the first time I kissed a man, I was like, wow, okay, I get it now. Suddenly all those love songs made sense to me. And again, I go back to that, you know, comparison in terms of that blind spot, if you will. 
I appreciate that you connected that to love, right? Because I think that so many times when people think about empathy and connecting with unlearning, right, they don't realize that the first steps of it is loving and loving yourself, right? Like stepping into some of that personal um, narrative around like your blind spots, what you understand, what you've assumed has always been normal, which is not really normalized in everyone's experience, right? Anchoring in that. So I love that you're doing the work internally yourself, because sometimes what we find here in the States is a lot of folks are so numb to the work that they're doing the work, but they're also creating so much internal chaos because they're not doing that self-care, right? Like like you said, they're not taking care of their temples. Um, they're not setting up boundaries. So then when they step in the space, they're causing more harm than actually good. Uh, so since you're such a, like, I would say expert at this point in this work, like you've been doing this a while. There's some young folks who listen to this podcast. I'm always at universities and high schools having conversations. So we have some younger listeners. What would you give them as far as tips if they want to get into diversity, equity, and inclusion work? What would be some of your tips? Well, first I'm going to say, and this might sound counterproductive, but I kind of hope that by the time they graduate, we won't have these jobs around. Because ultimately, what I'm hoping is, frankly, you two evolve. I hope we will work ourselves out of work that we don't need to do this work, ideally. Um, But in terms of um, tips, I mean, I know for me, what really does drive me uh, to do this, I mean, I've lived it, I have. I spent eight years in an organization um, suffering heavily from anti-Black racism and discrimination to a lesser degree homophobia. And again, I go back to speaking about privilege. What I learned when I was in that space is, I go back to my privilege, it was a large, public organization. Most of the full-time staff were frankly part of dominant culture. In this case, I mean white. Um, I'd say about 20% were racialized. Whereas flip the switch, when you look at your part-time or seasonal employees, I'd say it was reversed. So 80%, 70 to 80% were racialized, 20 to 30 were dominant culture or white, if you will. And anyone who spoke up, magically your contracts weren't renewed. And For me, when I started seeing what was going on there, I ended up using my privilege as one of the few racialized peoples who were full-time, who it was a unionized environment as well. So my privilege was to be able to speak up without, and again, where I'm going with this is not stupid. I made sure I had at least a minimum of three really good work reviews under my belt. So if they're looking for an excuse to fire me or get rid of me, they couldn't because I could say, look, I've consistently done a good job. So why suddenly... Has this changed? Um, anyways, where I'm going with um, this is the one of some lessons I learned that I want to impart to young folk and people who are just starting out in this business is one lesson I, it was a tough lesson for me to learn is I want a change to happen like that, like in a snap, in an instant. And one thing I've learned is change is not going to happen in a snap, in an instant. It is going to take time. That's a hard lesson to learn. It's a very bitter pill to swallow because I know people are frankly dying right now. And I understand that. I understand the gravity of that. But I also recognize that change is not going to happen overnight. I mean, and it's funny, since I started doing this, I've been thinking a lot about, in particular, the civil rights movement. I'm talking about racism right now, period. Well, not just racism. I shouldn't even say that. I mean, civil human rights for women, for LGBTQ+, racialized, what have you. I mean, these fights, none of this is new. And that's what I find, on one hand, scares me. But on the other hand, I find it kind of interesting, as in, what's that old saying? You move the pendulum forward, it swings back a little bit, but then you move it forward a little bit. So one of my advices for people who are just starting out is, again, you're unfortunately, patience. I hate to sound cliche, but patience is a virtue on that front. It's not going to happen overnight, number one. Um, number two, going back to that self-care piece, there are going to be times like you, you, you're not going to be able to save the world. And when I say that as in, you know, with one presentation, you know, one talk or whatever, it's going to take its toll on you as well. And you need to, you can't do this work if you're not healthy yourself. So make sure you either have a network of folks. I have a good, strong network of support people, um, both emotionally, you know, for my tough love, as it were, for my good love, as it were, um, and support. Um, But also even times where it's just, you know what, I need to sit and cocoon and like play a video game or read a book or whatever it is, just nothing to do with, you know, the fight. I don't know how to put it. So that is sort of the piece of advice I give because I often find I see a lot of younger folk. And it's funny when I think of activism, like my mother, I would call her an activist. It's funny. I never really thought of it this way. 
um, when I was heavily involved with the um, Black Employee Resource Group about that employer I was talking about, they were asking me, it's like, well, why are you, like, how did you do? And I was saying, well, my mother was doing this and doing that. Like, she was one of the founding members of the Congress of Black Women of Ontario, um, for example. Yeah, she's, um, like, very, she was one of the first Black teachers in the city of Toronto, the whole bit. And I've seen what she's gone through and what she's lived, and she really imparted a lot of that to me, um, as did my father. My father, what I learned from him was also a question, and that's another piece of advice I would give to young folk as well, is, and it's something I try to do myself, is, I mean, I try to live by my word. It's not easy all the time, but I always try to question. I mean, okay, I have an issue with someone. They're having an issue with me. Sometimes it's like, it's not, and many times I find it has nothing to do with you. They're just having a bad day. You just happen to reach them on a bad time. And this is where I go back to that empathy piece. As in, try to put yourself in another person's um, position, in another person's shoes. And then I go back to, again, what I think is one of the successes of breakfast culture. And I go back to my marketing background. When I was starting this work, I was a bit more, I don't want to use the word radical, but I'm going to use the word radical because I think it explains what I'm trying to get at. And I go back to that marketing piece. One lesson that I've learned, and this is a please take this um, piece of advice, my, the message needs to resonate with dominant culture. I get that. And I understand that. I understand also why we are where we are right now in terms of the major protests. And one of the things that does bother me about this space is, I mean, let's look at the concept and the messaging of defund the police. As I understand it, number one, I am not a, um, an expert in police reform by any stretch of the imagination. But when I started reading into that, the way I understand that concept, for example, is I view it as Indigenous ways of knowing. As in, the way at least I understand it is it's not about we're going to completely disband the police force. The way at least I understand it is let's look at root causes of crime. Root causes. I mean, maybe there's someone, Jane, John Doe, who's stealing food to feed their family, who's stealing, you know, a couple hundred bucks to make their rent. They're not criminals. We're not talking about organized criminals or things like that. It's like, I need to feed my family, make my rent, what have you. So if we look at ways to feed people, house people, let's transfer some of those funds into some of the root causes of crime. That's just another way of thinking, another way of looking at things. Do the police need to be so militarized, do they need all this money from a military um, perspective? And that's where I'm going back into that whole concept of Indigenous ways of knowing and just different ways of thinking. And so that's the other piece of advice I would go, I would give to um, younger folks as well. Is And I get it, when we talk about defund the police, it's um, a great, you know, it's a catchy little slogan. Unfortunately, what I find in the space, and I understand nomenclature and language is very important, and it is. And it's funny because I also find that it's the language that holds us back a lot. And I'm just taking that um, very broadly because on one hand, we have a group of people who are, well, what do you mean by defund the police? And then a group of people who are just, well, you know, we want to defund the police or what have you without sort of getting into it. I mean, even just the hashtag with Black Lives Matter. I mean, we saw what was going on with that and all lives matter. And that's one thing that really does bother me about this space is we get so bogged down in nomenclature that we're not even doing the work. And now to go full circle in terms of answering your question around that hopefulness piece, at least in Canada, cannot speak for the States, but in Canada, I'm a gentleman of a certain age or a lady of a certain age, if you will. Yes. (laughs) On June 2nd. So after that big massive photo op um, that happened in, in with the, that disgusting display of bravado in the U S on June 2nd in Canada, at least our prime minister he's the head of our government. And every single major political party leader stood up in our House of Commons and named racism. They stated racism is real. They went further evolved. Systemic racism is real in this country. Exactly. I'm looking at your face right now. That was my face. I was in tears. I was literally in tears watching this. And I'm having goosebumps as I'm telling it to you now because I never thought in my lifetime, I never, ever expected our political leaders to actually acknowledge that. They've had many, many, many opportunities and it's never happened. And this is why I'm cautiously hopeful before we can solve any problem, period, we need to name that problem. And I go back to that nomenclature piece. If we can't name it, then how are we going to solve it? And the fact that they stood up and named it what I found interesting is a few of our premiers, 
Ontario being one of them. I know Alberta. Um, there was another federal, there was one federal leader who I think, or member of parliament, if you will, who basically said, well, Canada is not the United States. We're different. There's no such thing as systemic racism here. And again, I go back to what I was speaking about earlier. I find a lot of, when I say dominant culture, I'm just going to say it, white people in this case, they don't understand what racism necessarily looks like or specifically systemic racism. And I remember writing a piece that talked about the difference between overt you know, the physical attacks, the verbal attacks, and systemic. We are getting towards our time. I want to be respectful of your time. So I did want to wrap up with a final question around where do you see yourself in the next five years, right? We're all about manifestations here at Boy Meets Wellness. So if you could share a little bit of that, uh, that would be great. That's a good question. Short answer is I'm still figuring that out. Aspirational answer. Ideally, I'm in, I'm doing a hybrid. I'm still keeping up breakfast culture with the speaking and the training in particular, while bringing my inclusion and diversity work in-house with a major brand or organization that I feel strongly connected to. So ideally doing both and living with my gorgeous husband, Jason Momoa. (laughs) Yeah. I was about to say that. Where's Bay in all of this? <laughs> yeah, it's funny you say that evolved, because I mean that's one thing professionally right now, I'll be really honest, I'm killing it. Personally, it's been challenging. And that's one thing. And it's when we talk about racism, there's a lot of racism personally. And this is the part that I don't think white people, I'm just gonna come out and say it, don't get or don't see, is it's not just the professional stuff, it's even in my personal life. And that's the part that I find most frustrating is I'm I mean, I I constantly see it and receive it in my personal life, like just constantly. And it's been challenging from a dating standpoint, to be perfectly honest. I mean, there's a guy who's interested in me. I'm a nice guy. He's attractive and everything. But I just can come out and say it. Like, I remember when all the Black Lives Matter protests were happening, he's sort of asking me these questions and, you know, how do you feel about this and what's that? And I'm like, he has no sense of racial awareness. I don't know how else to put it. And it's, it doesn't interest me. Like, I don't want to, yeah, I don't know. So it just doesn't interest me. I mean, I want to be with someone who I don't need to explain that to. I don't know how else to put it. And that's challenging to find. And I say that because as a racialized person, as a Black person, I was, and I say it now, I was indoctrinated into colonial thinking. And I'm going through that process now of decolonizing my mind. And I still catch myself with colonizer mindset. I don't know how else to put it, mainly just because I, yeah, I mean, I was brought up in this system. And this is what decolonizing your mind means to me. So to go back to that personal aspect, yeah, I mean, I'm finding it a challenge. I'm starting to meet more like-minded people. I mean, I'm for me personally, in the next five years, I want to start living more unapologetically Black, unapologetically gay, and unapologetically Jefferson. And I think that's important. And I mean, it's we didn't really talk about code switching, but I'm sure we're all familiar with the term code switching. And it's funny because I catch myself just code switching. I mean, it's I've been brought up to do that. It's It's like breathing for me now. And I find I still catch myself doing that in some spaces versus just being authentic. I don't know how to put it. And that from going back to that personal piece, ideally in five years from now, yeah, I'll have that day and, you know, that person to share my life with. Because frankly, Evolve, I'm quite happy with my life. I'm, yeah, I'm quite successful. I have a great group of friends. I mean, we're, and going back to my friends have always been the best part of me. We're getting together on the 18th. Um, we're doing a little virtual chocolate tasting. And we're all dressed up. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We, you know, had this chocolate of Mark Kenneth actually suggested it. You know, we hired this um, chocolate sommelier who's going to, you know, you know, curate some chocolates for us. And, you know, we're all going to get dressed up, have some cocktails. I, I, love how, I love how you were talking about Bay, and now you're talking about chocolate. You're like, you know, I'm ready. And when you're ready, Bay, I'm ready. My life is together. <laughs> we, have chop- we have chocolate being made. I have a great group of friends. I have family. Like that manifestation of my life is good. We just need you here. Hey, we just oh, need you here. Yes. And I mean, I'm looking for that. If I, it's a little harder now with COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, and frankly, and that's, I mean, one thing, a lesson that I've learned the hard way, and I don't think a lot of us necessarily learned this lesson is confidence is extremely sexy and attractive. And for me, at least, again, we're all on our own journeys, but I, for me personally, and I don't think I've shared this with anyone else, you're the one of the first people I've actually shared this with. Wow, look at you getting getting all the tea. Um, I know for me, I've made some massive changes in my life, I'd say in the past five to six years. When I say that is in literally physically, emotionally, and mentally. And 
all, all my friends, actually, a lot of my friends have noticed that too. They're like, Jefferson, this is the best you I've ever seen. Like I've known you for 20 years and you've been through a lot of shit. You've been through a lot of um, greatness, but I have never seen you more on top of your game. Like, I mean, holistically as I have now and keep it up. And that's going back to embracing change and going back to all this. So in five years from now, yeah, I will have my bay. I will maybe be living in the Bay Area, <laughs> um, ideally in the short term in a nice loft in downtown Toronto, but who knows? I mean, with all this working remote, I could, you know, live on the islands if I wanted to. My family's originally from Bermuda. I could move there and live there and do all my training remotely. Right? You could do anything with this, right? Like, this is such a new life um, that we're able to build. This has been an amazing conversation, Jefferson. I'm so excited I brought you on the show and we were able to talk. Um, before you go, how can folks support your work, right? Like, how can they um, bring breakfast culture into their organizations? Where can they follow you? Where can they find you? Sure. Um, so our website is breakfastculture.ca. We're very active on LinkedIn under Breakfast Culture. We're also quite active on Twitter. Um, unfortunately, it's Breakfast Culture. So culture without the RE and then the number one, breakfast culture on Instagram. We put out a newsletter. If you go to our website, our newsletter, we call it Secret Sauce. We have a different flavor, you know, maybe once or twice a month. The best and biggest way is going back to my hashtag is hashtag Let's Break Some Eggs. Pretty much on all social search, um, social channels, you look up hashtag Let's Break Some Eggs, you'll learn a lot about breakfast culture and hopefully with ideas that will spark you to break some eggs. And make some choices. Brilliant, brilliant. I love it. I love it. So quick question. Um, as far as your newsletter, can folks sign up on your website? Is there a link? Because I want to make sure that we include that in the show notes, if so. And we'll just include that link there. Is that possible? Yes. So you, if you go right to my website, um, there's a pop-up window. When you first time you go to breakfastculture.ca, you'll see secret sauce will come up, bottle of hot sauce, and you can sign <laughs> up right there for the newsletter. Okay, great. So we'll include that in the show notes, folks, if you want to sign up and stay um, in touch with Breakfast Culture. Again, Jefferson, thank you so much for stopping by. Um, I could see myself bringing you back in 2021 to have a deeper conversation. As you know, I just started actually a group coaching program called Speaking for Profit, uh, where we're actually tapping in and taking our learners from zero to building a profitable speaking business. So I would love to bring you in potentially as an expert trainer uh, for our next group because you just have some amazing work and some amazing thoughts. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Vol. My name is Jefferson and I'm a boy. I'm born obviously incredible. Thanks for listening to Boy Meets Wellness. Stay connected on and off the show by following us online at Boy Meets Wellness. That's boy with an I. Until next time, go be incredible. Be incredible.